I'm going to ask uh, Joel and Joanne Lucero, if y'all would, come forward. Uh-oh. Joel always has that look when I call his name. Uh, am I in trouble? Did I do something? <laughs> It is with great pleasure this morning that I am able to present to Joel his certificate as an exhorter in the Church of God. He's completed an almost 21 months of training and testing and all of that. I asked Joanne up here because he never would be here without her. I know that. <laughs> and um, it is with great pleasure to... Uh, present this to him, sir, and would you like to say something? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I just want to thank God because he helped me out, and my wife was also helping me out. Sometimes, like, telling me off, but, you know, nicely. You know? <laughs> no, I just want to thank God for he just his awesome blessings upon my, our lives and just for always being there and always just always just being God, you know. He's the best God you could ever have because all the others would just fall so far short, it's not even funny. And my God, he's always has been, you know, my dad's a pastor and finally I decided at 56 years old, 55 years old, just decided to do it. I don't know why, but, well, you know, <laughs> j j you know, I'm a Joel come lately, you know. <laughs> but I want to thank God for everything and pa thank you, Pastor, you were awesome. Okay, I'm going to ask if uh, some of you would feel like to come up here and we just want to pray for them and just pray that God is just going to bless their ministry and anyone that would feel so inclined, we just want to pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for Joel and Joanne. Thank you for their life, their testimony, their willingness to work, their willingness to submit. And God, I just pray, God, that you would bless their ministry. It may be late in life coming, God, but I believe that you have your hand upon them. And, God, that you will touch them and that you will use them and minister through them. And let souls be brought into the kingdom of heaven through their work and through their toil. And, God, I pray that you would bless them and bless their family abundantly. And we agree together in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Let's give them another round of applause. Amen. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of Luke. We're doing a series that started last week entitled, The Last Best Word. That last best word is grace. And we sing about grace, probably the number one song for my lifetime in the Christian community has been amazing grace. A few years ago, they added another verse to it and just sort of revamped it up again. And this morning I want to talk about saved by grace. The problem that we have is that we talk grace and live by works. This morning I'm going to speak basically the big points are from Ephesians chapter 2. We are saved through faith in Jesus Christ by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now we say that, and we read it, but have you ever thought, 
the implications of it. And it's interesting, and the text that I'm going to read is not one that we normally think of, but I think it's very important in us to understand exactly what God means by grace. It takes place when Jesus is crucified. Luke tells us this in chapter 23. Beginning in verse 39, it says, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The first step is to fear God. We are saved by faith, and notice here, we fear God. This is what the thief says. Don't you even fear God? It's amazing how many people out there in the world, because the world doesn't know a whole lot about grace. And that's because the world doesn't know a whole lot about fearing God. This thief, as he's dying, has come to a realization about himself. As we see here, he's going to admit who he is. He's rebuking his companion and say man don't you even fear God the book of Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge by the fear of the Lord men depart from evil and I would say also that the first step in faith is to believe God and to believe in God and one of the the signs or one of the attributes is that you're going to be fearful of God. Now, the second thing that he says here is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we know that this man believes in Jesus. We don't know if he's had any interaction with him. We don't know what he's heard. We don't know if he's ever heard a single message from Jesus or not. But he knows enough to know that this Man is innocent. And he believes in him. Now I doubt very seriously if he understood all the theological implications. I doubt if he could stand there and say and understand that Jesus is dying on the cross and it is through his shed blood that we are saved. I doubt very seriously if he knew, knew that. There's no indication here that he even believes that he is the Messiah. He just says, this man's innocent. That's the extent of his belief. But then he does something. And when we look at it, what we're seeing here is sort of a minimal effort. Most of us are familiar with minimal efforts. We usually learn it in school. Some people is, what's the least that I can do and still pass? Some people carry it on to the work. What's the least that I can do and still keep my job? 
We see it around us all the time. The great act of faith that this thief will make is simply this. He will ask for mercy. He says, remember me. Remember me. Remember me. Remember me. And sometimes all we can do is just simply, like this man here, is ask for mercy. So we have the element of faith here that we see in the fact that he believes something about Jesus. He believes that he will be coming into his kingdom, some kind of kingdom. He believes that this man is innocent. He's not deserving of what he's doing here. And so he's saved through faith by grace. Grace, notice the facts here. Number one, he knew he was a sinner. He said, what's happening to me, I deserve. That's a big improvement over most people. Most people think, no, there are people out there worse than me. This shouldn't be happening to me. But this man knew he was a sinner. And you know, that's who receives grace. Sinners. Sinners receive grace. Righteous people don't need grace. Sinners need grace. And what does that mean? It means, first of all, that he had done nothing worthy of salvation. There's no great deeds that he's done. The average person, if you ask them, what does it take to get to heaven? They say, well, you've got to be good. This story stands in stark contrast to that. We know nothing good about this man other than he says a few nice things about Jesus. He's done nothing. There's, he's condemned as a thief. He's paying his price. He's done absolutely nothing worthy of salvation. And yet, he's chosen. Not only had he done nothing worthy of salvation, he would do nothing worthy of salvation. There's nothing in his past. There's nothing in his future because he's dying that day. He will die a little while after Jesus dies. He's not going to do anything. You know, you, you can sort of see, you know, in Acts chapter 9, we read about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, and that was hard for some people to swallow. But God had to console them a little bit and say, well, he's, he's, he's going to be doing a lot of things for me. And we're sort of okay in our, like I said, we talk about grace, but we live by works. We're sort of like, well, if you've been a really bad sinner and God saved you, well, you better do something good to make up for it. Because we have that legalistic mindset. We have that works mindset where we think, okay, you've, you've got to make up for it. This guy's not going to make up for anything. 
He's not going to, if he's stolen anything, he's not going to return it. He's not going to pay them back. He's not going to go to them and say, I'm sorry, I stole from you. He's not going to do any of that. He's not going to go to church. He's not going to give any offering. He's not going to be baptized. He's not going to go to a Bible study. He's not going to do anything. And yet God saves him. That's grace. We want to look at in us, we want to say, well, that's not fair. That's not right. So he's saved through faith. It's by the grace of God. Grace. That's a, a word that we understand. It's, a, it's hard to define. You know, we give definitions, unmerited favor, things like that. But you see, it strikes against the grain of everything about us. This idea of grace. I can show you on how much we struggle with it because basically God expects us to give grace to others as well. And it generally comes through the form of forgiveness. Those of you who have been hurt greatly know how hard it is to forgive the one who's hurt you. Especially if they're not asking for forgiveness. And yet we forgive them anyway is what the scripture teaches us. But I know in all my counseling, that's been probably the hardest thing to get across to people because it's so easy to hold on to that hate. It's so easy to hold on to that grudge. It's so easy to hold on to that wrong. And God says, forgive them. But Lord, they don't deserve it. That's not the issue. You see, this thief doesn't deserve it. Hasn't done anything, will do nothing. His contribution is, he's mentioned here in the Gospel of Luke. He's a little side note on the day that Christ is crucified. Luke's the only one that will talk about it. He's mentioned in other places, but Luke's the only one that tells us this particular story. Because you see, grace, grace is being given. Thirdly, it is the gift of God. A gift. Now, we're familiar with the idea of gifts. Most of us gives gifts in our families, especially at Christmas. At Christmas, I give you a gift. You give me a gift. You give me a gift on my birthday. I'll give you a gift on your birthday. We're familiar. That's the way we do that because we know well, we're in the process here of being, you know, a good family member. You, we exchange gifts. They're linked. But the gift that comes from God is not linked. It's like His love. The Greek word that describes the love of God is the word agape. Basically, that means unconditional love. That's where I love you in spite of who you are. I love you not because of what you've done, but I love you anyway. 
That's that kind of love. That's the kind of love that God has for us. That's why he gives us this gift of grace. And again, we see the demonstration of that in this thief. First of all, the thing to notice here is that the unworthy is chosen to be first. Remember years ago I heard a sermon by Billy Graham where he was talking about this particular passage. And Billy Graham said that no doubt many had wondered who would be the first to receive salvation. Would it be David, a man after God's own heart? Would it be Moses, the lawgiver? Would it be Abraham, the father of the faithful? No. It's this guy. I'll give you the contrast here. You see, when God chooses to interact with us, he's always picky. Case in point, in Acts chapter 10, we have the story of Cornelius. Cornelius is the first Gentile to officially come in and disrupt the whole Jewish thing going on in the church. Creates a ruckus, creates a fuss. If you ever go back and look at the qualifications of Cornelius, it says he was a God-fearing man, he gave alms, he did a lot of good things, he was always doing the right thing. And God chooses him to be first because he knew it will be easy for them to swallow than somebody else. But when God shows us how he looks upon things, he's not picking out a Cornelius. He's not picking out a Saul of Tarsus who's trained and zealous and a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He picks this man, a thief unworthy, hasn't done anything good, will not do anything good. He is the recipient of grace. Because here's what we have to understand about grace. And again, it's hard for us because the least and the greatest receive the same reward. He gets, as we would say, he gets to go to heaven. Just like Abraham. Just like David. Just like Moses. Just like Peter. Just like James. Just like John. Just like Paul. Just like go on down the list. And this guy gets to go too. And he sees there's something inside of us that just sort of screams out, that's not quite fair, is it? And that's because grace has nothing to do with fairness. God doesn't treat us fairly. And when you understand that, you ought to shout out, thank God he doesn't. Because if God treated us fairly, we would all be dead. We would all be in hell. Because none of us deserve his grace. None of us deserve his gift. None of us deserve his love. He gives us grace because he loves us. That's the only reason. It is a gift of love and nothing else. The least and the greatest receive the same reward. Because that is the grace of God. The last thing I would point out about this particular story is this guy is nameless. We're never told his name. 
And I think he's nameless because he stands in for all of us. That's who we all are. Even the great Apostle Paul would say, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. When Paul looked at his life and all the works that he did, and he recognized, I've done a lot in my life. In fact, on one occasion in Corinthians, he compared himself to the other apostles, and he said this, I labored more abundantly than all of them. Man, we would look at that and think, you got an ego, don't you, Paul? But he qualifies it because he says, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. If I do anything good, it's because God's grace is there. It's been given to me and I use it and I do it. And so it's not to my credit, it's to the credit of God. And so this nameless sinner, this nameless thief gives what I would consider the bare minimum. And he's saved. Because that's grace. We all are in that situation. Like I said, it's hard for some of us Let's be honest, especially those of us that were raised in the church, gone to church all of our lives like I have. It's sort of like, it's easy to look around and say, yeah, um, I, I, I've got a leg up on the rest of these people. I understand this. Yeah, I understand the jargon. I understand the talk. But I don't have anything on anybody. Because we all need the grace of God. We are saved by grace. It is the gift of God. It's not earned. It's not deserved. It's grace. Now why is that good? It's good because sometimes... Sometimes we look at ourselves and we say, I don't deserve anything good. Well, you notice that's what this thief said too. I'm getting what I deserve. But Jesus welcomed him into paradise. We know that Jesus died first and then the thief. The way I visualize it, the scripture doesn't tell us anything about it, but I just sort of visualize it like this, that Jesus is down in paradise. And I don't know if there's a door. I have no clue. The Bible doesn't give us a whole lot of details. But Seemingly the first one through the door, if there is a door, after he dies, is this man. And who's there to welcome him? But Jesus. In front of David, Abraham, Noah, Elisha, Isaiah, all the prophets. This man, the recipient of God's grace. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you today. Help us to see, God, that it is by your grace that we are alive. It is by your grace that we move. It is by your grace that we exist. And I thank you for that today. Lord, I pray for those that may be struggling with this concept. I pray that they would realize that they don't have to be good enough to get it. 
that they don't have to promise all that they're going to do. That you are the giver of grace to the unworthy. You are the giver of grace to the one who has no hope. Now thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand, please. If you have a need this morning and you'd like prayer, I'd like to invite you to come down. There'll be people here to pray with you. Please come during this song. Is the concept of grace unique to Christianity? Yes, it is. I was just reading this week, and um, I believe it's Hinduism that believes in karma and reincarnation and that uh, they applied a little bit of mathematics and some one of their leaders came up with basically you had to come up with about 6.1 million reincarnations to compensate for the sins of one lifetime <laughs> so there's no grace there grace is the message most other religions want you to die for their God. Jesus said, I will die for you. Would it be correct to say the cost of grace given needs to be realized before true salvation can take place? Let's see here. Not exactly sure, but I will do my best. The cost of grace is totally on God's side. And we accept it. Now, again, Paul, and I hope the question is going to this area. Paul says in Ephesians, we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not by works, lest any man should boast. But then he goes on in the next verse and says, we are saved unto good works. So what that means is that while you do nothing to earn salvation, after you are saved, unlike this thief, if you continue to live, God expects you to do something, to show, to be obedient to him. And I think, hope that's what was being asked here if not i'm sorry <laughs> okay why did grace not cover the other sinner on the cross it seems like a work of faith is required and that is true but it's not a work of faith it's a statement of faith it is the acknowledgement putting himself in the hands of jesus when he says remember me it, the choice is left up to Jesus. If it was just a work of faith, then Jesus would owe him. And Jesus owes us nothing. Okay? Do we need grace beyond salvation? Do we always rely on grace without any works? Yes. We'll be talking about this more in the future. Basically, I'll give you a short uh, the Bible chapter that talks more about grace than any other is in Titus chapter 2. We hadn't even gotten there yet. But basically it deals with grace in three things. First of all, it deals with us in the past and the fact that we're saved by grace. Then it teaches us how to live in the present and then it teaches us to look forward to the blessed hope which is Jesus Christ. So grace is past, present, and future always need grace all right is that if we're saved will we go to heaven the moment we die or will we have to wait for judgment day depends on where you believe uh, i tend on the side of when you're saved you the moment you die you're going to be like stephen and see jesus standing at the right hand of the father and there you will be
other people think you will also citing Stephen that because yeah. it describes his death as going to sleep. All depends on how you take the word sleep, literally or metaphorically. I take it metaphorically. So those of you who want to take it literally, God bless you. If God doesn't treat us fairly, then why do we have to treat others fairly? God never treats us fairly. He gives us more than we deserve. And that's what he requires of you. That's why he says, forgive. Love your enemies. Don't treat them fairly. God is the judge, not you, not me. All right. A lot of questions today. Happy birthday, Dan Green. <laughs> And, and with that, we'll turn it over to you.